Welcome to The Table Podcast, where we discuss issues of God and culture, brought to you by Dallas Theological Seminary. Welcome to The Table, where we discuss issues of God and culture. I'm Darrell Bach, Executive Director for Cultural Engagement at the Hendricks Center here at Dallas Seminary, and my guest today is Robert Johnston, who has been at Fuller Seminary for how long? 21 years. 21 years, and your official title there is? Professor of Theology and Culture. Okay, so we've got kindred spirits in the room. This is a, this could be a dangerous gathering. Um, uh, because both of us have wrestled with how do you talk to the church and, and encourage the church with regard to how we culturally engage, um, particularly in a world that is shifting very significantly. And I think that may be where I want to start is um, you uh, are doing some chapels for us here this week, and you talked about the shift in culture, particularly the relationship between I think what you called truth, beauty, and goodness. And so why don't you lay out for us for, through that lens how you see culture shifting, maybe from the time, I guess, almost from the time you started teaching at Fuller to, the, to where we are today. What's, what's going on in culture and why is that important for Christians to be aware of? Yeah. Um, the, the, the little typology that I used, I, they're typologies so that there's strengths and weaknesses to those, but I'm happy to – I think it's true. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, it was high modernity. Mm -hmm. uh, Dragnet was the favorite show on television. Just the facts, ma'am. Nothing but the facts. That's and it right. was always ma'am because yeah. the women were the ones that were too emotional and, and, yeah. and subjective. Uh -huh. it, it, so there was sexism as well as rationalism uh -huh. that was going on. Uh -huh. And that's where we were. We were there as a culture. We were also there as a church so that we sought – that sort of objective, historical, critical mm -hmm. analysis of Scripture. Mm -hmm. We weren't very fond of literary criticism with regard to Scripture, right. for example. Yes. Uh, by the 80s, we're now beyond Vietnam, we're now beyond the Kennedys' plural assassinations and Martin Luther King. The, the country, including us in the church, are more concerned with making sure you show it before you tell it. So that rather than going truth, goodness, beauty, mm -hmm. by the 80s as a culture, we're going goodness, truth, beauty. Mm -hmm. That's when churches no longer have just uh, telling your kids what to believe and having fun, but now you're having service projects, mm -hmm. and, and, and you in your high schools, if you don't have service projects, you don't get into a good college mm -hmm. anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a there's a whole shift that's going on in church and society toward demonstrating your ethical um, viability or whatever, mm -hmm. and then then you can listen to the truth, and then it's nice if it's packaged well. But by the year 2000, we can take Pope John Paul as an example. John Paul stood up to a group of artists in 2002, I think, something like that, and he said, beauty will be our path to those outside the church and to our youth. Hmm. I think he's right. Mm -hmm. That if you look at the wider culture, you can call it a neo-romantic age. Mm -hmm. um, you can call it postmodernity. Uh, regardless, regardless sociological, of the label, regardless right. of the label yeah. we're talking sociologically, not philosophically right, at this right. point. There has been a move now such that it goes beauty, goodness, truth. So it's like, if I can say, it's like the football team, that's, uh, the truth is kind of having like the football team that's dropping down the, down the priority ladder, if I can say it that way. Except. Though I would probably disagree okay. in that I would say we're talking here epistemologically, not metaphysically. Okay. We're talking here in terms of how you receive the verities of life. All right. That's what those – So, So in effect what you're saying is rather than thinking about it kind of rationally in a detached kind of way, which might have been the 50s and 60s, right. now it is the, the role of experience, if I can say it that way, to drive us towards contemplating where truth may lie. And, and, and as a result, 
there's this there's this engagement with life that emerges out of that that isn't quite so detached or doesn't at least pretend to be so detached. Uh, correct, and 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 that engagement has both an ethical and an aesthetic dimension. Right, and that probably in the last thirty years there's been a flip flop as to whether the aesthetic or the ethical is more important. So that in seminary curriculum, for example, the ethicists will still argue everybody needs an ethics course. Right. Though they won't argue, everybody needs an aesthetics or a worship course. Right. But increasingly, the rest of us are saying, oh, ethics is absolutely crucial. But just as crucial is aesthetics. Right. And, and, and so there's a different way we're understanding reality, and that's happening outside the church, and it's happening in the church. Again, it's not saying truth is less important. Right. I'm not saying, saying that. that. Yeah. What I'm saying is you listen to somebody speak truthfully because you trust them and because it's beautiful, mm -hmm. because it has some transcendence or some sense of, of, of how it's meant to be. So we, we come at life in a different ordering. Now, let me put that into your question of okay. how that fits with our Christian faith and witness. When I was a kid, when I was in junior high, I went to a very strong church with an excellent youth program in Pasadena, California. I would bring my friends because I cared about the faith and I cared about sharing the faith. They would come once or twice and they would either politely have excuses why they didn't want to come again mm -hmm. or they would flat out say this is boring and I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. And I can remember asking as a 13-year-old to myself, why is the good news of the gospel heard as bad news by most of my friends? Hmm. And that's become a lifelong question for me, actually. It's mm -hmm. a vocational defining question. Right. That as God has continued to work with me, that question is central. And there's lots of answers to it, but one of those answers is that we're out of step with the culture, we're out of step with the questions that people really care about, mm -hmm. we're out of step with how we understand what's important such that we're, we're speaking not where they're itching mm -hmm. and we're not listening to where they have something they feel that's pretty fundamental. Mm -hmm. So rather- It's a huge disconnect. A huge disconnect. Yeah. And that's happening on an individual level, level, and that's happening probably more so on an institutional level. Mm -hmm. So I think individual Christians at the moment are being more effective than institutional Christian organizations that are getting a pretty bad rap at the moment. And I take it that one of the reasons you would say that might be going on is, is that individual Christians almost by default have to work at a relational level. Uh, that that institutional institutions, generally speaking, have trouble operating at, and so there's not that that interpersonal authenticity that you can build that can help you get there. I think that's true. I think, secondly, that just as say in the charismatic movement, our experience sometimes is a little bit different than our formal theology. Mm -hmm. So, or to give another example, I think it was James Davison Hunter mm -hmm. that pointed out that even though our formal evangelical theology would emphasize righteousness and justice and the honor and integrity of God, mm -hmm. that if you ask evangelicals how they became Christian, eight out of ten of them will talk about the love of God and um, being all you were meant to be. Mm -hmm. So that in our witness, we went to theological plan B. Mm -hmm. Even though in our theology we continue to stress theological plan A. Interesting. Well, uh, I, I, you know, cultural shifts are, are an interesting part of, of of thinking about this. I often tell my students that besides being a theologian, you also need to be a little bit of a sociologist in order to to engage and think about engagement, and particularly as pastoral. Uh, leaders thinking about how to address the complexities of life in the modern world. Uh, and what we want to do with our hour, that was kind of an esoteric introduction if I can say it, but what <laughs> we want to do with our hour is actually go to a completely different place, and that is to talk about how things that people share in the culture on a regular basis, things like movies, uh, television, 
uh, uh, music lyrics, uh, uh, commercials, uh, even something as mundane as commercials, uh, reflect on and, and give an opportunity for us to reflect in ways that we don't normally think about. I like to talk about uh, in thinking about this area, that usually when you think of seminaries, you think about places where you go to learn theology, learn the Bible, you go from Bible to life. But in fact, uh, the way most people actually engage life is they go from life and then they take their life e experience, whatever they're going through, and if they think theologically at all, they move towards <coughs> the Bible from the experiences that life deals them. It's it's the reverse direction. It's what I and and what it's what I call switch hitting, because. Uh, because you have to be able to go both ways, um, because that's how people are processing things. And I think one of the disconnects that we're talking about is theologians tend to engage first thinking about Bible as the lens and then trying to go and match up with what life may or may not be delivering, whereas most people's experience works the other way. Something is happening to them in their lives and they're sitting back and saying, what is God doing and how do I, how do I assess and discern what's going on? Fair enough? Yeah, sure. I, I totally agree. Um, you know, my own commitment as a teacher, as a minister of the gospel, <clears throat> is to ask the question, how can we bring together or relate or how can we dialogue between our stories, our culture stories, and God's story? Mm -hmm. God's story is primary. Mm -hmm. That's not the issue. Mm -hmm. But that we hear God's story within the context of the culture stories if for no other reason of translations of the Bible. But I mean, at some level, right. that's there. Mm -hmm. And we hear all of that from out of our own experiential base. So that if my seven-year-old daughter died in a car crash, I read Job differently than you read it. Mm -hmm. Or maybe you've had a tragedy. But I mean, that's right. That, no, that, exactly. But you simply read that text differently. Right. And that we allow that to happen in those extreme cases, we understand that. Mm -hmm. But we don't understand that that happens in all of life. Yes. So that we read those texts differently as a woman than as a man. Mm -hmm. We read those texts differently if we're from the fruits and nuts of California rather than from Dallas. Right. You know, uh, and the text is still authoritative. It still is saying what it's saying. But it it's in dialogue with our lives. Yeah, the angles from which the text is approached is is, is <coughs> significant in terms of sorting through it. Though, again, another illustration I like to use, I used for years to teach a class in Guatemala City with a colleague who teaches Old Testament at Denver Seminary and who actually had ministered down there for several terms before he came to Denver to teach. And we would take North American students down to Guatemala and we would and, – and it was hermeneutics class. And we said, you have to write one paper and it only is answering this question, how would you interpret the Bible differently living in this reality versus the reality you live in in North America? And we took them on a tour that showed both the best of Guatemala City and and perhaps more significantly, the worst of Guatemala City. Mm -hmm. We were only a couple of blocks from the garbage dump that literally runs down the city like a river. And uh, every time we went, every two years, it had moved further down the valley. and. Uh, and the experience of taking them into the dump and watching people live out of the dump was was always the meal afterwards was always one of the most fascinating times of the two weeks, as people either processed it by talking out loud so they could deal with it, or they just went silent. Um, and the point we were making in part is when you hit texts on poverty coming out of this environment and having to live with this reality day after day, that's very different than the almost kind of detached way we tend to view uh, poverty texts when you live in North America and you come out of a relatively well-to-do, certainly on a global scale, a very well-to-do background. Um, the, di the differences are almost inevitable yeah. uh, because of the, the, the radically different kind of experience that you're going through. And so my little slice on it mm -hmm. <clears throat> is not <clears> – <throat> that, but is saying the world is being shaped by a series of stories, mm -hmm. myths. Mm -hmm. We can critique it, we can say it shouldn't be, but in rural villages in Ghana, mm -hmm. they saw Titanic. Mm -hmm. um, our children are looking at the latest Disney movie, 53 times a year mm 
and can give the dialogue verbatim. Yes. Um, that, that is a shaping influence mm-hmm. in terms of how you process reality. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so that we can say, and I believe Scripture is authoritative, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but that authoritative text is heard in conversation with that read on reality that's coming from our television and our media and our film and 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 so on and that's both good and bad but we as christians need to be aware of that be conversant be part of that conversation or we risk being both irrelevant and um handicapped in terms of our own discipleship and and growth as, as, as Christians in the world. Thanks for listening to The Table Podcast. For more podcasts like this one, visit dts.edu slash the table. Dallas Theological Seminary. Teach truth. Love well. Love well.